Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 4 of All The Mods 7 To The Sky. Previously we worked on our block factory here and overhauled the look and aesthetic of our base. Going forward we're going to be using grey concrete and red terracotta. We made several different farms, a tree farm and a crop farm to get all of this all made. And we stuck with the principle that we want to build in buffers, meaning that we have quite a lot of byproducts here available to us now, for example wood. And actually we have a food source now in the form of apples. Not great, but we are running out of the these mineral berries. Anyways, what is the plan for today? Well, I mentioned last time that I want to get connected. After the base overhaul here, our applied energistic system is left in not a very convenient spot, so I would really like to flesh this out and develop this, implementing P2P tunnels. Before we start looking into any more AE, we do need some more space for it to be built on. I want applied energistics in the central hub, so to say, of our base, which is not going to be over there next to our sieves. And to build any more, we do need one more material, and that is the flooring material. And that's not something we have already set up, at least not in a permanent location. We have a temporary andesite casing builder here. And this thing is going to need a proper place. Ideally over there next to our block factory, probably in those walls actually. Yeah, it's going to look something like this. So to make andesite casing, just as a quick reminder, we have to first of all strip oak logs. We do that using this mechanical saw, and then we have to deploy that using andesite alloy. This is the input chest right here, but eventually this will be swapped with an ender chest. So we also needed a way to make andesite alloy, right? Which is what this little system here is for. We have an igneous extruder back there making us regular andesite. That's pumped into a drawer as a buffer, just using an iron pipe. And then andesite along with iron nuggets are piped into this crafter which crafts it into andesite alloy, and that is buffered again in a spruce drawer right here. Right now we don't have any way to transport it. I'm doing this manually for now, and we actually have a little barrel here. Although I think this once again will be sw switched out with an ender chest. Wait a second. Andesite alloy goes here, and this one is actually for wood inputs, which we can get over here. We're getting this from the output of our tree farm. Again, this is not automatically transferred over, but that's exactly what we're going to be working on today. For now though, it's enough for us just to fill up these chests. And it should start batch crafting here for us. In fact, it's probably a little bit slow. We could do with speeding this thing up. We just have to increase the speed of this motor here. We have it at minus 12 RPM. Let's take it up to like 24. Yeah, that looks a bit more acceptable. I swear it's raining like every five minutes in this game. <laughs> it was just raining a minute ago. And I sleep like almost every night as well. I don't know what's up. So, between the episodes, I've been doing a little bit of material processing once again. And shout out to a few of you guys who commented saying that you could shift K. Shift K will automatically craft everything into raw ores for us. It's so much easier than having to do this in the crafting grid. And it allows us to free up some of the space in these drawers here. Some of them were ending up a bit full. They're going to need some upgrades for sure. So yeah, we'll have to decide on a place that we want the center of our base to be. I'm thinking that we go out this way a, a little bit. And we're going to start badge crafting a little bit more applied energistics material. Namely silicon and the processors and whatnot. Although I think that's something we'll look into the automation of today. Let's get ourselves some space for the AE controller. Yeah, like this seems pretty good. We're going to have our controllers in the middle here down below. And our terminals on this back wall. The plan is to have some corridors off to the left and right side as well. And probably some extra staircases and corridors that double back this way so we can get up to higher parts of the base. Still to be developed, of course. Alright, so applied energistics peer-to-peer, -peer, or P2P. Oh, we're out of Skystone. We should be able to fix that. This enrichment chamber is going to be tied up for a while. So you know what, let's see if we can grab some tier installers. Oh, and we're out of Osmium. <laughs> we're out of everything, this is why we need everything connected here. Taking it up to basic should allow us to at least do three items in parallel. And we'll give it some energy and speed upgrades too. So yeah, P2P, why is it important? Well, Applied Energistics can only allow you 32 channels per face of the controller. Every device you plug in, a terminal, a disk drive, a pattern provider, an interface, all take up one channel each. And if we were just to start plugging things directly into the controller like this, I mean, we could potentially get away with that, but we're going to have a lot of cables ending up all over the place around the base. P2P allows us to get around that. We're looking a little bare bones on our materials here. <laughs> Let me actually do some crafting and gather the materials we need. Alright, so it's been like an hour. We got more Fluix cable, a farm more string for wool, lots and lots of processors, P2P tunnels, slime balls, and then I've just done a bunch of general material processing, smelling up some of the ores. I made up a few more ME controllers here and arranged them in a, a cube sort of a shape. I think we're ready to get going though. I have a bunch of materials here. So yeah, what we want to do here is give ourselves enough channels to be able to finish the game with. Did I just... 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> this size of controller right here is going to give us way, way more than enough channels. Like, there's no way we're ever going to use this many. Remember, every side of the controller can give us 32. Some people like to put a dense cable on the face of the controller and then put the P2P tunnel on there. That's definitely inviable, but in my experience, I prefer just putting the, the P2P directly on the face of the controller like this. And actually, you know what? We're not going to use the insides. We'll do it outside of the controller like this. And the reason for that is because we can't put dense cable connected to the other end of the P2P tunnel. We're forced to use either this glass cable or smart cable. It's the same except the smart cable can show you the channels in use. But yeah, smart cable or flux cable can only allow 8 channels on it. Which means we can only have 8 of these connected to one line of the smart cable at once. And we also want to be careful we don't connect it to this part of the controller, so we need an anchor. That's going to stop the cable from connecting right here. We also need one on this side. There is a lot of different ways you can wire this controller. And in fact, there's ways to hit every single face here. I don't think that's going to be necessary for us, honestly. But yeah, what we want to do here, we have six P2Ps, so we can technically afford to go two more. Just to keep it nice and neat, though, I'm going to leave it the way it is. And then we want this to go into our second ME controller. This is our subnet. So I'm going to place a dense cable right up the middle here. And then on every other face of this, we can just have more P2P tunnels. So now every side is exactly the same. And just with the existing connections, we could theoretically have 768 channels. That's way more than we'll use in the next couple of episodes at least, so we can leave it at this. We may end up actually just disconnecting a few of these things just to save on power, as each of these controllers does take up more RF. In fact, you know what? Yeah, let's just do that. Let's just use one side of this controller right now. I guess we'll put a flux point on the bottom for now. So that, yeah, only these five are lit up. We'll connect the rest whenever we need to use the channels. You might notice that right now these things say they're offline. So we want to transfer the power that we're given this controller here into the subnet one. We can do that with the use of quartz fiber. These allow power connections to be passed, but not the channels. So now that we've powered this on, we can see there are six channels in use. That's our six P2P tunnels. And all of these say they are device online and unlinked. That's the state we want them to be in. And that's basically it. That's, that's all we have to do to wire the controller. We can add as many of these P2Ps as we want, as long as we don't go over 32 on this main dense line. At which point we have to add more dense cable up the middle here. From here, what we want to do is make sure we don't touch this dense cable. We want to come out with a separate connection. And in fact, we'll probably go in every all four ways here. It's possible to also expand this controller into a 3x3 or basically whatever size you want. Just the one block right now to save power though. And then from here, the first thing we want to do is power the terminals over there. So I'm just going to use glass cable since it's cheapest. We're not going to use over 8 P2P connections in this direction for now. Oh, this is this is so hard to wire. We, we really need to create a flight. Okay, so we got the wire here. This is where we want the other end of the P2P tunnel. So effectively what we're doing here is we're plugging this dense smart cable directly into the face of this ME controller right here. So now all we have to do is link the two channels together. We can do that with a memory card. We can shift right click and then just right click, I think, on this side. And now it says it's linked, it's on the output side. The frequency is 9B39. That should match up with the one we have on this controller here. 9B39, and we now have access to 32 channels. So we don't need to use this energy acceptor anymore. Since we're getting power from the main net over here, that's always transferred through the connection of the P2P tunnel. And yeah, we should just have access to our AE system as normal. Easy. But we want to have our whole base connected with applied energistics, right? And since I can foresee way, way more channel usage down this end, we're definitely going to use smart cable. Or dense cable, I mean. So this way, we're basically allowed 32 channels of P2P connections. And once again, we're going out over... You know what? You know what? No, we're not doing this without flight. From what I could see, I think the only option we have at the moment is a jetpack from Iron Jetpacks. We start at the bronze tier. I've been processing a bunch of alloys here, including Electrum Invar in bronze, which is quite fortunate. We need a leather strap. Oh, we don't have any cows yet, do we? Do we have leather, though? I think we might... Yeah, we got it from the Wandering Trader. That's right. Next, we need a capacitor, which is... This, yeah, this seems quite easy. We're out of sticks, though. <laughs> All right, there's the capacitor. We need two bronze thrusters. Almost the same materials here. Yep, there is the bronze jetpack and a quest. Let's upgrade to Invar. There's the Invar. Next, I think, is Electrum. Uh-huh. Can we go one higher than this? Signalum? Yeah, we've made Signalum before. It costs elite coils this time. Actually, diamonds is not something I, I think we have that much of. We're only at a couple of hundred. I mean, okay, that's <laughs> that's quite a bit. We have a we definitely have enough for this. We don't have any more redstone, though. That's probably in the drawer over there. Yeah, 300 diamonds and 8,500 redstone. You know what? We can actually take this all the way up to Enderium tier, which I think is the last tier before Creative, which is not, which doesn't have a crafting recipe. It's all very manual crafting right now, but I think it's going to be worth it. Let's just make sure we keep these metallurgic infusers full. 
Let's keep the batch crafting going. Yep, more steel, more refused alloy. Lots more flux crystals. We need a way to charge this thing. I think you used to be able to do it in these. Perhaps not. In the energy cube, maybe? Yeah, there we go. I did upgrade this to advanced, by the way, just to allow for more power throughput. I didn't want this to be our bottleneck out the output of our reactor. And it looks like right now, passively, our base is consuming around 1,500 RF per tick. So we still have some headroom for sure, but I think that means we're also burning more uranium. We got plenty. Yeah, not to worry, we got plenty. Yeah, 19,200,000 RF buffer. Oh, nice. I think it has a hover mode as well. Yep. Oh, this is rapid. Whoa. This is like infinity armor speeds. Oh, and it even has a, a slot here in the bobbles. Yeah, that uses a significant chunk, 200,000 RF. 150,000 RF, more like. Honestly, not a bad deal for how cheap that thing is. Yeah, you know what? I think we'll muffle this. I wish there was a way to slow down, though. This is a little bit fast, especially without inertia cancellation. Oh, wait, I think I found it. There is a way to slow down. We can increase and decrease the throttle. Oh, yeah, that's so much better. And now we can efficiently wire our base up. It appears we've already run out of cable. And to make more, we do need some more wool. I think it's about time we start looking into some mob farming of various forms. But not right now. Look at, the, <laughs> look at the amount of string we can get just from doing this. Oh, yeah, and shift key. Easy. First things first, we give each area a new P2P connection. We could just pick a free spot on our controller here, we'll pick this one. Link it up to the new device. That way we have 32 channels now on this line. And now when I was making all of this setup, I purposely left the underside of all of these storage controllers free. There's nothing underneath, so, which means that we have space for our storage buses. Yeah, I don't know if these have changed between versions. I haven't played this version of Applied Energistics. We definitely want it to be bi-directional so we can send items in and out of this storage controller. However, I think in this case, I think this is the only case we have this in the base, at least right now, we have this ender drawer. I mentioned that this could potentially cause us issues if we were to also put a storage bus on this one, since AE would think that we have 959 times two, when in actual fact, this is a shared inventory. So I think to get around that, we we should filter these ones only. So we want to specify this can only store gray dye, sand, gravel, gray concrete, and gray concrete powder. And from this filter over here, we'll emit the grey dye, we'll add everything else though. And that should avoid the duplication effect in Applied Energistics. So we got them all connected, we should only see 900 odd grey dye. Oh yes, it works. 979, I think it's taken from the bone meal that we have in our drives, and it's crafted more, that's why we have an increased amount. But it's not double this, which is the important part. Excellent, so all of these items that we now have here are exposed to our AE system and we can see them in the terminals. We can also give one here to our wood drawer. And one more thing is, I like to set the priorities on high priority. I like to use a thousand for everything. High priority storage inserts first and extracts last, which is important to keep the drives clean, especially if you have external storage like we have here with the drawers. We can also hook up our clay and terracotta drawers here. This time the alternate ender drawer, the clay one, we have down there, which is not hooked up to AE. So we don't have to worry about filter in this one. And we don't need a filter because the drawers are locked. So it should only accept the items that are supposed to be inside. Anyways, I think the only other things we have to hook up here is our sieve output drawers. I hope I left enough space here for the wiring. Mmm, we might have to get fancy here. <laughs> uh, how are we going to manage this? Okay, that took some uh, some cable shenanigans there. <laughs> Probably best if we don't ask too many questions, but we got everything hooked up here. But I've been working around here just to try to clean up the areas that we already have. And I've been thinking about our next project for today. And that is going to be auto crafting. However, before we look at autocrafting, there is one smaller little project I'd like to take on. I want to see if we can automate the production of obsidian. Collecting this the way we've been doing it with the Philosopher Stone and gathering it with this unenchanted diamond pickaxe is really starting to get very old. And the best way I can see of doing that is actually just using stone barrels. If we have lava in the barrel and we pour water over top, it does give us obsidian. And then we can easily just pipe that out and send that into storage. And we lost that barrel. So I guess we're going to have to first start with a source of lava. And unfortunately, the nether here is a void world, which means we can't use the infinite lava trick from create. So in that case, we're going to keep using these crucibles right here. And I want this to be fairly robust, the lava production. So we're going to go kind of overkill with this. Going to make a lot of these. So here is what we're going to do. I think we're going to start with four rows of seven, at least to begin with. And of course, we need a heat source on these crucibles. Previously at our sieves, we've been using uranium blocks, which gives a heat of 20, which basically will influence how fast cobblestone turns into lava. However, a few of you guys pointed out that you can actually use superheating elements. The superheating elements will give a heat of 60, I believe. Yeah, look how fast it's turning cobblestone into lava. That's great. Oh, <laughs> That's so good. 
So now we need to feed these with cobblestone and then pump out the lava. My first instinct was to use Xnet like we have been doing at our block factory over there. But why not look into something new? You guys have pointed out that laser IO exists. I have no idea how to use this mod and it may prove not to be the correct tool for the job. But let's try it out here. A lot of these crafts seem to use these logic chips. All right, there's half a stack of those to get started. We'll grab whatever other goodies have been smelting here. Look at all this stuff. We need to get this automated. I think probably next episode we'll look into ore processing. But yeah, laser IO, let's make the wrench. Okay, so I have a cobblestone generator here. If I was to guess, we put the connector on the generator. Oh, that's very small. <laughs> that's tiny. And then I'm guessing laser nodes on these crucibles. Maybe not. It might be backwards here. We were close, but not quite there. Okay, I think I figured this out though. So these nodes can interact with different blocks around them. You connect the two nodes together using the wrench. It's going to form a laser. And then inside the inventory of this one, you select it down. The item card you put on extract, which will pull items from the cobblestone generator. And then you also have to have an item card in the other laser node. And that's going to distribute the cobblestone into the adjacent inventory here. Then we can have another one on a tank. And then we can use a fluid card instead. Or as well as the item card, I guess. The fluid card we want on extract and then you just link the two nodes together. However, I think we are going to keep using Xnet. As you can see, nothing stacks here. <laughs> so it makes it very difficult to expand this if we were to do that. I think Laser IO is a really cool mod. It's made by Direwolf, actually. It's really awesome. I think we're going to definitely find a use for this later on. But for this specific case where you have lots and lots of different connections, I think Xnet is best because you can transfer more items more easily without any upgrade cards. And it's a lot easier to configure rather than having to go into every single node and give them two cards each and then also set the insert or extract or whatever. If laser IO had a controller block like Xnet does, it would definitely trump it because there's no wires everywhere, right? But yeah, for this application, I think Xnet is going to serve us better. Copy, paste, 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 paste. Oh, look how fast these things are filling up. 63, 64, this is like a bucket per second. Not too bad at all. So we got all the crucibles hooked up, ready to go. They're being buffered in this crate tank. I know that we have mechanism black hole tanks or fluid energistics or whatnot, which can hold like way, way more than these things. But these things look cool. And if it turns out we need more lava storage, which I don't think is going to be the case. But if it turns out we need more, then we'll look into probably fluid energistics will be our go to. On the opposite side, we now have our barrels covered in water. Also got Xnet connectors on there. We have a separate controller. I want to make these networks separate. Although on second thought, maybe that's not a good idea. Yeah, you know what? Let's actually just join these networks together. That's going to allow us access to all four of these fluid tanks since we have connectors on all four of these things. So we should just be able to join the network cable together here. Yeah, and then from the one controller, we can make a fresh channel, a fresh fluid channel and distribute from all four tanks into all of the barrels, which should be at the bottom of the list. Yes, perfect. Paste, 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 paste. We should have obsidian. Yes, yeah, perfect. Now we just need to pump this into storage. One more channel for items. Copy, paste, paste. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. I think we got this place done. We got lava and obsidian automated here. We got flashing tanks. I think that's just because there's lava being pumped in and out of this thing, but once the buffers fill up, it should stop. And obviously we wanted the drawer of obsidian to be connected to applied energistics, but because of the positioning of this P2P tunnel, it was actually after the lava tanks, I didn't really want to spaghetti up the cables over here. So instead the obsidian goes into an ender drawer, which is next to this tank. What just happened there? <laughs> oh, is that the jetpack? Was that the particles from the jetpack? Is that what that is? Yeah. <laughs> That kind of scared me a little. Yeah, we got an ender drawer there that's connected over here next to our clay. We should make sure to link it up to the drawer network. And now we should see all of the obsidian and applied energistics. Yeah, almost 2000 already. Wow. Mission accomplished. And with more easy access to obsidian, it means we can add some void upgrades to these drawers right here. This one was actually overflowing and we had items spilling everywhere. But I did turn it off about an hour ago, so <laughs> I think we can safely turn this thing back on now. And yeah, we'll address these civ setups, I think, next episode. Looks like Prismarine also needs a void. Oh, and one more upgrade we can make over here is switching out this oak wood drawer. I think they keep inventory, right? Yeah. We're going to instead switch this out with an ender drawer. And that way we can have wood automatically fed into our andesite casing maker here. Link up the frequencies. I think I hit the wrong button. It's left click for the frequency. There we go. 
And that's just going to keep using wood up until it fills up this drawer, which I think the maximum is 2000. I don't think there's any storage downgrades in functional storage. That would have been really nice. I don't see the downgrade though anywhere. I uh, must not have looked very hard. <laughs> there is a downgrade. Okay, that's good to know. Make sure we configure this item pipe around the back to send it into charcoal as well. Since we've done the wood, we might as well also switch the andesite alloy. Okay, so let's continue to develop our AE2 system and try to at least get some basic auto crafting on the go here. There is a few things that we're going to need for this, starting with our crafting processors. And we need both co-processing units, which take the crafting unit. This isn't too bad. It looks like we're out of logic processors. Hopefully this will be one of the last times though that we have to do this manually. In the meantime, we can also make up some molecular assemblers. This is what actually crafts for us. We got 49 here. And connected to those, we'll need interfaces. Oh yeah, that's right, the new texture. We're out of iron. Uh oh. Yeah, so trying to get prepared here, I smelted up a bunch more iron and resources. I also started preparing some space for us to put our processors and interfaces on. I started batch crafting some more silicon, and then used some of the resources that I'd finished to craft the crafting units, crafting storages, and co-processing units. As well as making sure we had enough clearance for the wiring. And I think by now we're ready to get going. Auto crafting is a very, very fun part of modded, and it's super, super powerful. So we're going to start with the CPUs, the processors, which we are required whenever we start a craft. Crafting storages, the yellow blocks here, these can go up to, I think, 256 in 1.18. Yeah, they increased it to 256k. The higher the number here, the more complex the craft you can start. And the co-processing units determine how many crafts in parallel you can have in one crafting task. So these have to be formed in a multi-block structure. I think it has to be square. Or maybe not square, but... It can't be a, a weird shape. We're also going to have a crafting monitor to be able to tell what exactly the, the processor is crafting. And I think we'll arrange them something like that. And for the time being, we'll start with four. We can again expand this as we need. In fact, we can even make this 3D. We could, for example, do this and make it a cube. All right, we got some spares, but we can make use of those when we expand. On the opposite side of the room here, we want to set up our interfaces and molecular assemblers. This is what actually perform crafting tasks for us. I guess for these, we'll just set them up in a sort of checkered pattern, something like that. <laughs> That's a very long tooltip. I think it's because these now support fluid crafting, which is definitely something I want to check out. That's that's something new to Applied Energistics. All right, so again, we start with the 3x3, but we can expand this into a cube. We just have to be wary of channels here as well. The processors over there count as one, as one multi-block structure. However, these interfaces count as one channel each. Which brings us on to the next step, we have to get all of these wired up. So from our subnet controller, similar to the way we wired the terminals, we're just going to come out with some, I think for now, basic smart cable since it's cheaper. We can always upgrade to dense whenever we have more channels on this line. And so right around here, we're going to place our P2P tunnel. Pick an unused P2P on the main controller and link these together. That gives us 32 channels on the output of this thing. So right now there's only 20 channels in use because we only have 20 interfaces. However, when we expand this, I think we'll have to add more P2P connections. For right now, though, we can just run a dense cable after the P2P, and then just some smart cable to hook up all of our devices up here. We want to keep the cables nice and straight here. That's <laughs> that's definitely something that you want to do early. Do not try to tangle all the cables. In fact, you can dye these and color them. Some might say that's the proper way to do it as well. Connecting them up should light up the molecular assemblers here. Perfect. And in the tooltip here, we got 20 channels in use, which means they are all online. Oh, the Wandering Trader. He's here. Oh, he's going to sell his blue ice. And rice, actually. I might actually take those deals. Yeah, sure. Anyways, we got to wire up our processors in exactly the same way as that we done the interfaces. Link the P2P tunnels, dense cable up the middle, and just plug everything in. You know how they say old habits die hard? <laughs> I was actually in a creative testing world yesterday just and uh, I tried to set up auto crafting and I knew that this was not right. So in previous versions of Applied Energistics you need interfaces next to the molecular assemblers. You guys were probably screaming at the, at the monitor. <laughs> There's probably some comments but now they separated it out into pattern providers and they are different. Uh, let me get enough of these to replace the interfaces. Yeah mistakes happen but we can use these interfaces for sure. So yeah they split up the functionality of the interface into two two different blocks. The pattern provider is what you give all of your auto crafting patterns and the interface is how you supply items. You can basically stock different items and then pipe them out of the interface and I think you can also pipe in fluids and items in here and ingest them into AE. Who knows why they separated them? If you know let, let me know in the comments. Either way these interfaces need to be pattern providers. Since when did he make a sound like that?
So now that we fixed that and got everything wired up, we need blank patterns to get this going. This is how we encode our recipes. This goes inside an encoding terminal. I think they changed the name of this, right? It used to just be the pattern terminal. The first rule of autocrafting is you want to autocraft the autocrafters. Let's start with the crafting table recipe. So you can just shift click from JEI, encode the recipe. We don't want any substitutions here. Substitutions means that it will substitute plank oak planks specifically for any other planks in our AE system. But since we have oak wood farmed, I want to use specifically oak wood. And then from here we need another terminal. I don't know what they called it now. Is it the pattern access terminal? I yeah, it must be this. And this shows us all of the molecular assemblers on our network. It says we have 10. Why do we only have... Oh, I only switched out half of the room here. So now in the pattern access terminal, each of these rows correspond to the internal inventory of these pattern providers. It's basically these slots right here. So if we put this pattern inside, we should see it show up in this access terminal. And we can also auto craft crafting tables if we had oak planks. <laughs> Let's add a recipe for oak planks as well, from logs to planks. Yeah, now we should be able to ask for this item. It's going to craft the planks first, then the table. And of course, the more crafting storage you have, the more complex a craft can get. But yeah, from here, we basically just have to encode every recipe that we want to auto craft. And yeah, now life should be a whole lot easier when it comes to crafting. And we'll expand all of these setups as we need to and encode the recipes as we come across them. There is still machine crafting, like we're still fill filling these things manually, but I think that's maybe something we'll look into next time. But we managed to get the basics of AE. I mean, I don't know if P2P is the basics, but <laughs> we got our applied energistic system fully implemented here. We got our drawer systems connected up with storage buses, and we automated the production of lava and obsidian. We are already up to 8,000, which I think is the cap on the drawer, 8.2 thousand. Anyways, that is also a good point to wrap up the episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys for all the support on this series, by the way. It's been awesome. But yeah, I'll see you all in the next episode.